If the tight end position really is the next level X factor for the Dolphins offense, the Dolphins may not be done adding to that room here in 2024. We are looking at the 2024 NFL draft class of tight ends here today on Locked on Dolphins. You are Locked on Dolphins, your daily Miami Dolphins podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Your team every day. All right, Miami. Welcome to another episode of Locked On Dolphins. It is your team every day here on the Locked On Network. I'm your host, Cal Krabs, a lifelong Miami Dolphins fan, host of Locked On Dolphins, and co-host of Locked On NFL Scouting. You can find our shows on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Tip of the cap to our every dayers, because it is your team every day. We don't just say it, we live it here on the Locked On Network. Today's episode of Locked On Dolphins is brought to you by Monopoly Go. I'll admit it, I've got a competitive side, and it is a big fan of Monopoly Go, the mobile hit twist on the classic Monopoly game. Join your friends and download Monopoly Go for free on the App Store or Google Play. The tight end position is our focus today. We've worked through a slew of positional groups and the final positional rankings uh, that are out there specifically for uh, the Dolphins and their anticipated schemes on both offense and defense. And it's been a really enlightening uh, experience to kind of stack a draft board and put the Dolphins players on it this year. That content will come next week, rest assured. Uh, but I do have over 225 players on the draft board and graded for the Dolphins and what they do. And um, I've been a draft Nick for about a decade now. So this is, uh, I, I have enough in the bank as far as draft classes to know this is an above average draft class in a lot of ways. And the tight end position is one that I think has some really fascinating competition as far as who are the top 100 players that end up getting their name called. Because I think when you you put yourself in the shoes of evaluating for the Dolphins, uh, there are a number of needle moving talents that could potentially be top 100 type selections if the Dolphins find good value at 21, which there's, I'll be honest, one player that would make that uh, uh, be the case, or if they move and shake up and down the board and add more day two picks, or if they move back from 55, or even if they stay at 55. Like I, I have a grand total of seven tight ends graded with first through third round grades in this year's class. And they all do different things. And I think that's one of the things that makes the tight end position one of my favorite to scout and favorite to watch and, and favorite to see how they're implemented across the league. There's so many different ways that tight ends can make an impact. And every once in a while, you'll catch one who can do it all. And that's really where the conversation starts with Brock Bowers. Because uh, Brock Bowers is, of course, from University of Georgia, the consensus top tight end. Rumored to be in the consideration in the top 10 picks in the class, uh, often mocked to the New York Jets. I would not be surprised if that indeed is the case, and the Dolphins don't get an opportunity to draft Brock Bowers. I, I think the general uh, consensus of him being a top 15 player in this class will manifest itself on draft night. But here's what I want to impress on you. I don't think the drop-off from Brock Bowers to my tight end two in this class is so exceptional that this is a all or nothing proposition. Um, and I have changed the criteria in which I have graded tight ends this year in comparison to what it was last year when Darnell Washington was the consensus tight, top tight end for me and what we felt the Dolphins needed with an inline player who had some linear athleticism and a lot of power. Um, this might make Daniel offense. It is more angular. It is more athletes in space and being able to move across the set and having some vertical separation, not just running the seam because you put your arms in the air and you got an eight foot ring span and catch radius. So this skews more towards athletes, H backs, flex tight ends. They're graded a little bit more favorably this year. Ironically enough, the two guys at the very top are guys that can do almost anything. And I'm being a little dramatic here just for the sense of, of like toying with my food. And uh, we'll go ahead and un un unveil Ben Sinnott from Kansas State is my second ranked tight end in this year's class. I have a early two grade on Ben Sinnott as a player. 
And I think the best way to put him into context is to talk about who he is and what he was for the Kansas State offense, uh, because Ben Sinnott comes from a Kansas State offense that didn't throw the ball all over the field, although they did have better quarterback play this past year than they've had in, in many seasons, and that's manifested in the numbers for Ben Sinnott. He, he caught 49 passes for almost 700 yards and six touchdowns for Kansas State this past season after 31 for 447 and four touchdowns the previous season. He has a career average of 14 yards per catch and 11 career touchdowns. Uh, as a tight end, those are strong numbers. But then you put that through the lens of who he is on tape and not just the production and not just the athletic profile, which we're going to talk about in a sec. He does everything. I think he's a better inline blocker than Brock Bowers. I think they're comparable in space blockers. I think they're comparable athletes. They're of comparable size. Uh, Brock Bowers did not do any uh, testing throughout the pre-draft process, and that has kind of created some question about the athletic profile or whatever. But he's six foot three at the combine. He came in at six foot three, two hundred forty-three pounds, and he had thirty-two and three quarters inch arms. It's a plenty acceptable wingspan and arm length for a tight end. When you consider uh, Sam Laporta last year had 31 and a half. And that was one of the questions uh, for him as a player was the length. And lo and behold, when you're a former wide receiver playing tight end, uh, you run routes to a degree where you get the kind of separation that it doesn't matter. But uh, Ben Sinnott, in comparison to Brock Bowers being six foot three and 243 pounds, Ben Sinnott is six four and 250 pounds. Uh, and he has 32 and three eighths inch arms versus 32 and three quarters inch arms. So about the same amount of length. The difference is we have athletic testing for Ben Sinnott. We ran a four, six, eight with a one, five, nine, 10 yard split. That's 70th and 81st percentile respectively amongst tight ends in the last 25 years. Ben Sinnott had a 40 inch vertical jump at 250 pounds. He had a 10 foot six standing broad jump. That's 97th and 94th percentile for, for athletes at the tight end position. He had a 6823 cone drill, which is better than most wide receivers run. That's 96th percentile amongst all tight ends in the NFL, in the NFL combine since uh, 2000. And his two, uh, 423 short shuttle was 81st percentile. The top hits, this is where it gets interesting. The top hits for Ben Sinnott from an athletic profile perspective include, it's not limited to, but it includes TJ Hawkinson, who's a top 10 pick. It includes Dallas Clark. It includes Sam Laporta. And it includes. John U. Smith. The difference is I think Ben Sinnott has TJ Hawkinson out of Iowa level blocking capabilities as a comparable athlete to John U. Smith. That's it's kind of jarring. So if the Dolphins want to address and not just address, but invest in the tight end position, they're going to have another opportunity. And I know Ben Sinnott gets to the third round and all your, your mock draft simulator mock drafts. I get it. I'm just telling you, it, me evaluating the player, I think there's a lot higher floor and higher ceiling here. And it, it softens the idea that the Dolphins might not get a chance to draft Brock Bowers because everybody has romanticized Brock Bowers as this best tight end prospect since. And he's an outstanding tight end prospect. He's my top tight end. I think the impact that he has in the passing game, some of the ball skills, I think that's where he does have an edge over Ben Sinnott is the ball skills, the catch radius, the concentration, the contested catch ability that he has and brings to the table. Uh, that is all really needle moving stuff as a pass catcher that I just don't think it's, it's fair to expect Ben Sinnott to have, even if he is this plus plus and comparable athlete, um, Case in point, Benson had a contested catch rate this year of 35%, uh, which is obviously if you're you're talking contested catch and 50-50 balls, that's less than 50-50. So uh, Brock Bowers definitively is the top tight end in this class, but not the only player that when I, I put it on the horizontal draft board, which is where I put all the players in their grades in accordance in columns by position, and then I put the Dolphins' individual players on there. Brock Bowers and Ben Sinnott are the only two tight ends in this class that grade higher than both Durham Smythe and Johnny Smith. I've got another close runner-up as tight end three. 
But Brock Bowers and Ben Sinnott are definitively upgrades over what the Dolphins have at the position, in my opinion, with how high I've graded the players. And if I told you there was more than one opportunity to have that kind of addition to the roster, that might surprise some people. But that's where I stand on these tight ends. We are going to talk about uh, some of the other viable starters long-term that are available in this class if the Dolphins do ultimately choose to invest in this position group. That is next here on this episode of Locked on Dolphins. Stick with us. Wouldn't it be great if you could see all of your investment and retirement accounts in one place? With Yahoo Finance, you can consolidate your views from multiple accounts into a singular hub and access expert analysis you need to tend to your entire portfolio with confidence. When it comes to your financial future, you think you've done it all. You've saved, you've researched, you've invested what you can. Now you need to take those investments to the next level by using what every financial great uses, Yahoo Finance. For more than 25 years, Yahoo Finance has been the brand behind every great investor. They're the number one finance destination in providing a holistic look at the financial news cycle, including breaking news, original editorials, analyst ratings, independent research, customizable charts, and so much more with the community over 90 million users each month. Their real strength is helping you on your way to financial success. For comprehensive financial news and analysis, visit the brand behind every great investor, yahoofinance.com, the number one financial destination, yahoofinance.com. That is yahoofinance.com. So having two tight ends and knowing you're going to have a swing at somewhere in the first two days at a potential upgrade opportunity is a nice place to be. But there's more flexibility than that, too. And I know I'm I'm a little bit on an island here, uh, but but the, the way that I find the uh, solace of being on an island with this next opinion that I do ultimately have is knowing how it worked out last year. <laughs> Uh, there was a tight end last year in last year's class that I checked in significantly higher on and really liked the athletic profile and how he was used and there being NFL translatability to his game. And he wasn't really talked about as a day two pick. He goes in the first two rounds and that's Brenton strange from Penn state goes to Jacksonville at 61 after Luke Schoonmaker at 58 and you had the run early with Musgrave in the 40s, and Michael Mayer slid to 50, uh, 35, and Laporta at 34. And obviously, had Dalton Kincaid at 25. So last year's tight end group, it was a busy group with a lot of guys that went early. I ultimately do think last year's tight end class was better than this year's, but there are a couple of players that fit the mold of what we think Miami wants with their tight ends, including this player, uh, my third-ranked tight end, very closely graded to both Smythe and Johnny Smith is Theo Johnson from Penn State. Uh, this is if you want the ultimate uh, athletic profile potential type of player. Uh, Theo Johnson is a former wide receiver. Uh, he's from originally from Canada. He gets recruited to Penn State. And this is the... Mike Gusecki type <laughs> athletic profile. Six foot six is 92nd percentile, 260 pounds at 75th percentile. His wingspan is 80 and three quarters inches. That's 78th percentile, 33 inch arms. That's longer than both Bowers and Senate. 11 inch hands. Okay. So now you're getting into basketball, power forward, small forward type territory, just from a size perspective. And then he had a four, five, seven. So he ran a four, five, 91st percentile. He had a 155 10 yard split, 91st percentile. He jumped 39 and a half inches at six foot six and 260 pounds. That's 96th percentile. He had a, a 10 foot five standing broad jump, which is 93rd percentile. And he had a 20 yard short shuttle, uh, which is uh, a 20 yard short shuttle of 4.19 seconds, which is 87th percentile amongst all tight ends since 2000 at the NFL combine. This is like everything's 90th percentile plus. Outstanding athlete. And I think when you you look at that profile, it maybe paints a certain kind of picture of what Theo Johnson is as a player. But then you watch him on tape and you appreciate in the same way that was applicable to Brenton Strange, 
this was just not an efficient offense. And I think they really underutilized and did not do a, a, a good service to a lot of their talent. Uh, so there's a late transition. He transitions to tight end once he gets to Penn State. Uh, the ball skills are through the roof because he's a former wide receiver. There's some savvy to utilize his size and his length to create separation. And when he puts himself in tight to the alignment at 260 pounds, there's a certain floor that like you just can't perform below. And he doesn't because he's 260 pounds. Like even if you're not the, I think Ben Sinnott's a better inline blocker. And I think Brock Bowers is probably a better blocker in space. But he passes the sniff test on both of those things because he's ultimately 260 pounds and a plus athlete with explosiveness. And because he's got this massive wingspan reach radius influence that you just, it's the uncoachable element. And I think that gives him a little bit more wiggle room to come into the league and have an impact on passing downs and keep his head above water in the peripheral areas of the game until he ultimately does make the jump. I have a two on Theo Johnson. Would not be surprised at all if he goes in the second round. And then I have four third round grades at tight end. And this is where the variance really starts to take place. You've, you've, you'll notice I haven't mentioned Jatavian Sanders from Texas yet. He's in the threes. I think he is a little bit more of a developmental type player and probably a little bit more of a develop, developmental player than I would ideally like to see the Dolphins take. I have Jaheim Bell from Florida State rated in the third round. I have Jared Wiley from TCU rated in the third round. I have Jatavian Sanders rated in the third round. And I have Cave Stover from Ohio State rated in the third round. There's there some pretty reasonable options. Of course, the challenge out of this group is the Dolphins don't have a third round pick as things currently stand. The question of course will be, well, will they, won't they find a way to secure one or not? Jaheim Bell. I really liked, uh, this is, he doesn't have Johnu Smith on his athletic profile comparables page, but he's the player who I think skill set most mirrors Johnu Smith. And there's some good tight ends here on this list, including Jordan Reed, uh, from Florida. Uh, is a 80% match from an athletic profile perspective. Chigo Conquo uh, with the Tennessee Titans out of Maryland in 2002 is another one that's a match. It's six foot two, 240 pounds, 33 inch arms. So he's long, even though he's not tall or dense, he's still long. He ran a four, six, I had a 10, four standing broad jump. That's 88th and, and 91st percentile with a one, five, eight, 10 yard split. That's 86th percentile. If you want to groom the replacement to Jonu Smith, who's under contract for two years. Uh, Jaheim Bell, I think, is a player that makes sense, but that's kind of where you get into this territory of, with your premier assets, do you not want to add snap takers for you at a certain volume? I'm not sure Jaheim Bell's there, so this is a player that instead, I think, makes a little bit more sense, as well as the guys after him, including Jatavian Sanders make a little bit more sense if the Dolphins are able to add more picks and if they are able to capitalize on adding more day two picks and the run on tight ends doesn't happen because it's a non-premium position and it's not the draft class that it was last year, I think that's where you can find a little bit more solace in taking a player like this on the second day is if you have two other contributors out of the class who you feel like are going to step into meaningful roles for you. Uh, Jared Wiley is the one in between Jatavian Sanders and Jaheim Bell. He's um, he's super smooth. I think that's the thing that stands out the most to them. He's six foot six, two hundred fifty pounds. He's the longest of all the tight ends that we mentioned, and he's also explosive. Explosive four six forty yard dash, uh, one six two ten yard split. That's sixty fifth percentile. Thirty seven inch vertical. That's eighty eighth percentile. Uh, almost a 10 foot. It was nine feet, 10 inches on the standing broad jump. That's still 68th percentile. And some of the matches for his athletic profile include uh, Travis Kelsey, Martellus Bennett, Drew Sample, uh, like some, some meaningful players uh, at the tight end position. He's not the blocker that some of these other guys are, but he's also not the run after catch receiver that like uh, Jaheim Bell is. But what he is, is he's the massive catch radius and ball adjustment guy. 
I think we we invoke the name Mike Gusecki talking about Theo Johnson, but I actually think Jared Wiley's game is the one that probably most mirrors Mike with one big difference. Uh, this dude is not only a straight line athlete. I think that's the the biggest difference uh, between the two. And, and he, I believe, was a quarterback before transitioning to tight end uh, as well. So this is somebody who's really toolsy, athletic, natural receiver, uh, the kind of the high point player. Go back and look at the touchdown catch he had against Colorado this past season. But then they do some stuff with him where he's in motion across the set, and that's where the alarm bells start going off. Okay, when you're moving the tight end and moving him at the snap, that's where you you, you kind of sit up in your chair a little bit and you say, okay, well, how deep do the, does the parallels run with what Miami does with their players? And this was a player that I think you saw him move. They got him on the run. They get a running start on some blocks on the perimeter. They used him as a point man on blocks on the perimeter. Like he could do all that. And I think that's why the, the biggest difference for him and Jatavian Sanders as to why I have Wiley in front of Jatavian Sanders. And I, of course, have Cade Stover also in this third round bucket is the biggest question I have with Sanders is the blocking. I did not see a lot of value blocking reps from Sanders on tape at all. And that included in space. That included against defensive backs. That was not just, oh, he's in line, it's short yardage. Oh, he's going to split flow on inside zone and try and kick the defensive end and ends up getting walked back into the gap. This is one-on-one -on -one in space with a safety. And the ball carrier's got the ball behind him, and you're the only guys on half the field. And we still aren't hitting blocks. So that for me for Sanders is it, it feels a little bit too much like a pass catcher only as compared to a multi-tool weapon, especially when you have a pass catcher tight end now in John o. Smith for the next two seasons that has that blocking element down. So if you want to draft Jatavian Sanders, if you're the Dolphins, please do it in the third round after you've added more picks. And make sure your two picks before that are, are volume snap takers. And then if you want to justify, we used a third round pick on a long-term developmental error for this style of player to come into our offense. And we think in 2025, he could be an impact player uh, and an error and potentially allow us to transition from Johnny Smith early. Okay, cool. But if you're going to say, we're going to stick at 55 and we're going to pick Jatavian Sanders. I'm going to ask why. Because I don't see the pathways for him playing early. Based off of the tape and the fact that uh, out of all of the names that we've mentioned, he, he tested the least impressively from an athletic profile perspective out of any of this, him or the five names in front of him in the tight end class this year. He tested as the worst athlete. Got some day three guys to just touch on as far as guys that are intrigued to me. That is where we're going to bring this thing home here on this episode of Locked on Dolphins. So stick with us. I have been accurately told that I have quite the competitive streak to me. And my competitive side just so happens to be a massive, massive fan of Monopoly Go. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's been downloaded over 150 million times. Times It's a great twist on Monopoly where you play not one, but hundreds of Monopoly boards in crazy locations, building up amazing cities that bring you big money. But here's the best part. You can really mess with your friends. I charge them rent on my iconic properties, just like classic Monopoly, but I can also heist their vaults for riches for myself. And the leaderboards show who the biggest Monopoly tycoons are. But it's not just my competitive side that gets a kick out of Monopoly Go. You could team up with friends and people from all around the world in time tournaments to win huge rewards. So get in the game and join your friends. Download Monopoly Go now for free in the App Store or Google Play. I did a grand total of 13 tight ends in this class. I may sneak a few more in at the buzzer, but they're, they're all projected as late round guys. Uh, the next three guys are guys that I have day threes on, or early day threes on as third round grades, or fourth round grades, excuse me. Uh, including one player who I have heard a lot of questions about, probably because he played in Florida, uh, Johnny Wilson. I had a lot of questions out of the wide receiver big board and rankings group talking about Johnny Wilson and where does he stack for you? Would you like him late? All that kind of stuff. And Johnny Wilson, for me, 
uh, I think is too far off the spectrum of traditional wide receivers to be somebody I'd feel good about projecting to that role. Case in point, the athletic profiles here is as far as comparable players. He's six foot six, 230 pounds, 84 inch wingspan, 35 inch arms. Yes, he ran a four five two with a one five five ten yard split. The top comparables from a, a, a physical profile perspective, and this is the kind of players that I have the same concern with, include Hakeem Butler from 2019, TJ Vasher from Texas Tech in 2021, Travis Fulgham, who was here for a cup of coffee with the Eagles a few years back, uh, but came out in 2019, Quentin Johnston. I don't see the same gear of explosiveness that guys like Nico Collins, who ran a 4.55, and T. Higgins, and even Mike Evans uh, kind of ran a comparable time in the pre-draft testing than Johnny Wilson. But Mike had this really incredible um, ball tracking ability that while Johnny Wilson makes some good adjustments, I don't think he makes those good of adjustments. And he's also two inches taller than Mike. So there's an extra added loss of center of gravity as far as changing directions and your stride length and being able to change how you get in and out of your breaks. Whereas if I think if you put him on the spectrum of tight ends, I think that's where you really get intrigued by what he can be. As far as athletic profiles at the tight end position that are top fits for Johnny Wilson, Kyle Pitts, Mike Gusecki, David Njoku, Jelani Woods, Logan Thomas, Foster Moreau. Those are meaningful NFL tight ends. Now, you have different kinds of skill sets for how they succeed in not running routes, but I think there's enough ambiguity there that I would just put him in the classification of being a tight end. And I think in the third round, early in the, or on the third day, early on the third day of the draft, that's where you kind of get the appropriate risk-reward type of conversation for a player like that. I also have Eric All from Iowa, formerly of Michigan, and Dallin Holker uh, from Colorado State. Holker's really good after the catch. It really surprised me uh, for a guy who didn't necessarily have the most robust athletic testing, uh, but he's got a really good receiving prowess, and Colorado State featured him in the passing game to a, a good degree, and uh, I, I was really taken away when I watched Dolan Hoker, uh, I think one of the challenges here is he was originally at, at BYU starting back in 2018, then did the two year mission. And that was back in 2021 and 2022. So this is a guy who's an older player who had 70%, 60% of his crew receptions and 60% of his crew receiving yards and 67% of his career touchdowns, 70% of his career touchdowns came in his one year at reduced level of competition at Colorado State as an older player. That's the, the, the question is, okay, you had the big breakout in that regard, but you're not quite the same athlete. What's the ceiling there? Is it more uh, Luke Wilson from uh, Stanford type of conversation? Maybe. Uh, I think there's enough questions there that that's a day three player, but a really intriguing one. Uh, Tip Ryman from Illinois, big time inline blocker, probably the best blocker in the entire class. Uh, had a re really, really good testing numbers as well. Uh, the challenge for him is he played in an offense that just quite frankly could not pass the football with any level of consistency. So uh, route running, creating separation, contested catch situations. He got some work down in the low red zone, uh, but there's some – questions as far as usage that I, I just don't know that you're going to have the definitive answers to like some of the other guys in the class. And then I have two guys with seventh round grades to, to bring us home with Brevin Span Ford and Trey Knox uh, from Minnesota and South Carolina, respectfully. So I got seven guys with day one and day two grades, two guys that I think would step in and had potential to be the best tight end on the roster. Uh, a number of other guys that could be long-term heirs or successors to roles that Miami in this offense, the past two seasons has had or pursued. It's really interesting to me. Uh, it's a really interesting group of, uh, and crop of players. 
And I would not be mad about seeing the Dolphins invest in it if they were serious about being more of a 12 personnel team. The challenge is getting a proper intersection of pick and value with the limited resources that you have. And again, this is a, a finite, limited resource league, and that's what makes it so super unenviable for all of the layers of these decisions that compound and stack on top of each other. You can only do so much. But if you went the tight end route, you now know where I stand on it. That's going to do it for us here on this episode of Locked on Dolphins. It is your team every day. I appreciate you guys for checking out the show. Make it a great rest of your day. Fins up. I'm out of here.